There we go. Oh, there we go. go. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Mary Prenon. I'm the Director of Communications for the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors. Thank you all for joining us for another Breakfast with Benefits. And today we are going to learn all about insurance myths and what's true, what's not true, and what you need to know to help your homeowners, home sellers, home buyers out with. And we have our friends from Allen Block Insurance today. We have um, Joanne Murray, Neil Bush, and we Good also morning. have Laura Murray. And um, thank you all for being here. And I guess, let me just ask you before we get started, uh, Joanne and Neil, do you want to take questions as they come along or would you rather wait to the end? And I'm guessing we want to put the questions in the chat. Um, put them in the chat and we're, um, I, you know, I guess we could take them as we go along, Neil, Laura, yeah, are you okay, okay with that? that? Yeah. yeah. Um, because we're going to go from some personal residential stuff to commercial and so um if we wait till the end it might get a little more confusing so let's just as as they come up we're happy okay. to take them all righty okay and with that i'll i'll let you two take it away thank you so much all right all right um why don't we go to the next screen and just want to introduce ourselves. We're with the Allen Block Agency here in Terrytown. I'm Neil Bush. I'm the Vice President of Personal Lines. And joined today is our president, Joanne Murray, who's uh, going to speak on some topics. And also Laura Murray Pagella, who's our Vice President in Commercial Lines. So you'll get a good overview of what's affecting both um, residential and commercial sales and rentals. Okay, let's go. And then, uh, well, as we said, if you have questions, we can we can address them as we go along. Um, so this is a brief overview of the topics we're going to be covering today. High insurance rates can impact both commercial and residential sales. And there's a lot of reasons behind that that we're going to cover. Uh, the insurance process has created unforeseen complications when you sell or lease a property. Mm -hmm. That whole process has changed greatly in the last three years, and we'll explain why. Um, insurance rates have been skyrocketing, and many insurance companies have become more risk averse, either by tightening eligibility and making it more restrictive, or some companies have even pulled out of the marketplace, mm -hmm. leaving fewer uh, selections when it comes to um, uh, quoting different policies. And the third, now claims more than ever have become um, scrutinized. Uh, they're factored in when rating a property in determining eligibility on it. Um, flood zones have also made it harder to obtain insurance. And that's, that's another topic that we'll be discussing as well. So how insurance is affecting residential markets? So a brief synopsis of why rates are going up and why we've seen um, some more than, than more rate increases and consistent rate increases. There have been changes in weather patterns that have been creating more frequent and more severe storms. I've lived in Westchester all my life and when Storm Ida came through in 2021, I don't think I've ever seen water accumulate that quickly in this county. And more properties have flooded. More people had damages to the exterior and, and the interior, their basements. Um, and that's just one example. National Weather Service now designates hurricane season from June 1st to November 30th. Who would think that in around Thanksgiving, we'd be worried about a possibility of us hurricane hitting the East Coast down, say, in Florida, and maybe even making its way up here, which is what has happened both with Storm Sandy. Ida came from uh, the, the Gulf area, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi. So that's the changes in weather patterns are a big reason why, why rates have gone up over the past few years. Materials to rebuild the homes, the costs have gone up and they've gone up for many reasons, supply chain issues, there's shortages, there's 
thing there's uh, back orders on uh, supplies. Go into the Home Depot these days and see what a piece of sheetrock or plywood will run, and it'll give you an idea. Um, building a home in Westchester today, especially if it has some custom items, can can really cost quite a bit, anywhere from five hundred to a thousand dollars a square foot in some areas. Uh, the increased costs and longer time frames to settle the claims. These supply chain issues may take it longer to settle the claim or repair damage from these, uh, from storm damage or other types of claims. Changes to the reinsurance market, which I'll just briefly touch on. Um, reinsurance costs, which is the cost that an insurance company pays a, um, a company to essentially provide coverage for them have gone up greatly. And moratoriums, this is, and this is big, especially in some of the coastal areas, Long Island, uh, along the shore and Mamaroneck, fewer companies are offering coverage. They're either writing it at a very high premium, they're making it very restrictive if they're gonna write it at all, or some of them have even just shut down in certain zip codes. Um, prior claims is one of the things that has really come about. In the past, if you had a buyer who was gonna buy a home and they came to us and the companies run what's called a clue report or a loss run. And in most cases, if the claims showed up and they were attributed to the property that's being purchased, we could simply go in check a box and say, hey, they were for the prior owner. We're excluding it. This is a new buyer going in and uh, go from there. This has changed. Uh, they've gone to a five-year look back. They're not only looking at the claims made by the person buying the home on their previous properties to see what was there and if there was a frequency, but also looking at the claims for the seller or the owner of the home. And if there's a water claim, it's going to open up a real Pandora's box as far as asking for information. Some companies will decline it right then and there. They don't wanna see any water claims within five years. Some will ask more questions. Uh, what caused the loss? How much damage was caused? Was it all remediated? And they may want photographs or they may want a plumber to go in and write a statement that the plumbing system has all been updated and is in good working order. Um, so it's very important now that if you have someone who's interested in buying a home, that they come to us, and this has to be done by the buyer, and ask for a clue report or a loss run to see what's there. And, and we can do that and quote the home at the same time to see if it meets eligibility guidelines. But it has to be done with this um, by the person buying or the individuals buying the home because we will need their names, their current address, and their previous address so that we capture all the information that would be relevant in uh, evaluating the risk. Joanne, do you want to answer? There's yeah, there's a question in the chat box, um, Neil, that asks, um, does an insurance quote include detached structures? It does. So, uh, well, I'll answer it on a standard homeowner policy, and it will insure the main dwelling, and then there's a sublimit in there for other structures on the property. Generally, that's to cover things like tool sheds and fencing and hardscapes and things uh, but if there is, say, a, a uh, in-ground swimming pool or a pool home or a separate cottage, that can be endorsed onto the policy separately so it's properly insured. So why companies are declining risks? And we get phone calls on these all the time. The main one we're seeing right now is the roof age. Um, people who are buying homes generally have an inspector come in and they're they're going to go up and they'll look at the, the shingles and all and they'll, um, if they're doing their due diligence, we'll put a stamp of approval on the roof. But if the company goes out there and they can, there's so much information available these days, 
They use drones to fly over the roof. They use aerial photography. And they can also look back at the town to see when permits were applied for to replace a roof. And if it's over 20 years old, there are companies that basically it could be pristine and they will not accept it. So roof age is becoming more and more of a thorn in everyone's side, even if it's in great shape. Um, and I'm talking about a roof that's asphalt, yeah, architectural shingles, that type of a roof. Slate is a different story, and there's and I'll cover that briefly. But there mm -hmm. are some companies that have even decreased the age of the roof that they'll look at. We have one that will not write a policy for a roof over 15 years. And we had one recently come in and say they will only go back 10 years. So it's very important that this information is captured when someone's looking at a house and get some type of verification as to roof age. Slate is different. They look at the condition of the tiles and make sure that they're all in good order. And they make sure that it's been with a slate roof that gets serviced from time to time. And they want to make sure that it's been well maintained. So roofing material does matter. Um, flat roofs, there's very limited markets for. Uh, so that's very important to check that out. Flat roofs can either be on your older homes built in the 1800s, like we have here in Terrytown Sleepy Hollow, or they can be your more modern designs, uh, your Frank Lloyd Wright type homes up in Pleasantville and Chappaqua and things. So it is important to ask that question when shopping for insurance. Uh, I mentioned that satellite imagery is used for aerial views. Um, more and more companies are being hired by the insurance companies that use drones. And now there's even a program that's built in that will give a percentage of the trees overhanging the dwelling. They want to make sure that trees don't fall on the house and that large branches can't come down. So they will look at that as well. Um, you could have this really beautifully landscaped property with overhanging trees. And if the trees are old and a large percentage is overhanging the home, a company may require it to be cut back. Uh, moss growth is another thing that has become prevalent. They look at discoloration on the, on the asphalt shingles. They look for the moss growth. Um, hopefully that's all they want is the roof to be cleaned, which can be done professionally um, and that the roof doesn't need any further repairs. But yes, moss is a, is a big item. Um, inside the homes, they do look at the electrical panels to make sure it's updated. Um, I can't think of any company that will allow any fuses. They all want circuit breakers and they all want them to be updated. Uh, the Stay Block and Pacific Electric panels, we don't run across very often, but there are homes that, believe it or not, still have them, and they would have to be changed out. Um, handrails on all stairways, and it can vary by company, but usually four risers is where they would require it. They want to make sure that someone can grab onto and not fall. Underground oil tanks. That market has severely shrunk. There are not many companies that will insure a home with an underground oil tank, even though uh, a, a leakage might be excluded. Um, they still have that restriction. So if that can be negotiated and pulled, that's the time to do it is when the home is being sold. Uh, EFIS siding is your um, manufactured stucco. Uh, Pre-2000 had problems with moisture getting behind it and mold forming. So many companies will not accept an EFIS home. There are some that we see in this area. I see more in Jersey, but there are some in Westchester. Thank goodness most of them are newer, but they want to have a service agreement where somebody can come and test the EFIS each year and do a moisture test to make sure there's no mold accumulating. And again, swimming pools. Swimming pools usually are not a problem. We ask if it's above ground or in ground. They do have to be fenced at, with a self-locking gate. Um, and they usually will ask about diving board slides, things like that. Um, again, that's a prohibitive item. And there aren't many companies that will accept those types of, of risks. Uh, on an above ground pool, there's a, again, they want to see that the property is fenced and has 
either a cover or some type of a um, a ladder that that will lift and slide up so people can't just climb and jump in. Neil, we have two questions. One okay. is, what is EFIS? Okay, EFIS is a fake stucco. It was started to be manufactured in the late 80s, early 90s. It gives the home a stucco look. I've seen it on um, a home in Pound Ridge, one in uh, a couple in Chappaqua. So it's not real stucco. It's almost like a uh, almost like a vinyl covering, but it's it's sturdier than that. However, moisture gets trapped behind it and forms mold. So if you see a stucco home, the question is, is it real stucco? Okay. And then is there insurance on sewer and water? Um, we'll get to that coming. There's two. That's a two-prong question. Um, we will go into uh, coverage for a sewer backup into the home. And then there is a endorsement that many companies are offering these days called uh, buried utility lines, which will cover excavation if a sewer line needs to be replaced because it's not operative and there's an interruption in service. Okay, thank you. Okay. And uh, I'll turn it on to, I'm going to turn this over to Joanne Murray, our president, who's going to go over the next section of our presentation. So Neil touched on, you know, why companies are declining risk, which is probably our biggest challenge right now. I, I will tell you that daily, not only are we struggling with new homes that you come to us that people are buying, but existing homes that companies are non-renewing um and so it, it's kind of scary for us so i i have to tell you in in 40 years i've never seen this this is this is the worst i've ever seen so um so some of the things he touched on are, are very important um people need to really maintain their properties that's probably the most important message we can get out um but some of the eligibility factors um, that that wrap around safety and security um, affect the eligibility as well. And some pumps um, are are an issue. And believe it or not, you you might look at a home with a sump pump and say, "Oh, that's a good thing because it's going to help keep the water out." But the insurance companies look at it as um, it's a scary thing because. If the sump pump fails, if um, the the water that's coming in is it can't handle it, if there isn't a battery backup, if there if it isn't hooked up to a generator, then it won't work, and so it scares the insurance companies, and so they've become much more diligent about asking questions about sump pumps, and they must have a battery backup or be hooked up to a generator because otherwise, if the electricity goes out your sump pumps of no value. So that that's mandatory now. Homes over a million dollars, they have to have a central station burglar and fire alarm. There's just no getting around that anymore. Um, that's a requirement. And I would say in most cases, we see people that that's not a problem. Most people have that. And with the new ring um, security systems, um, people are much more inclined to even put them in because they can do them themselves. Um, water leak detection is huge because water losses is probably one of the primary losses that insurance companies have now. So they are requiring um, water shutoff valves in secondary homes. Um, it actually, I have to tell you, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I, you know, sometimes people resist it, but if you have a secondary home, when you're not there, you have no idea what could be happening. And the last thing you want is when you go to open it up, find out that a pipe froze and broke and, and that the, the water is running everywhere. So, you know, putting in a water shutoff valve in a secondary home really makes a lot of sense. And there's the mow and flow um, alarms and there, there actually are, are multiple ones. The water leak detection is a little different in that the water leak detection is going to tell you that there's water leaking somewhere in your home. It doesn't shut it off, but it lets you know. And um, 
you know, there, there are many, you can buy those in Home Depot, you can hook them up yourself. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm all for putting those in now there. It's, it's just really interesting that um, there are so many ways that we can protect our homes from loss. And the last thing you want, believe me, is a water loss. It is, there is nothing worse than, you know, pulling up soggy carpeting and buckled um, plywood and wood. Um, it, it's just a horrible thing to go through. So those water leak detection um, products are really worth looking into. Um, prior water claims, they, they, they will require the water shutoff valve. So if anyone has had a prior claim and it was a water loss, the company is going to require the shutoff valve. Um, as Neil said, it used to be that if the claim belonged to the person selling the house, the person buying the house, we didn't have to worry about. We just wrote the insurance. No longer is that the case. Now they're looking at, there was a loss there and they're penalizing the buyer as well. So um, we wanna make sure that we have um, whatever products are available to make sure that the house is gonna be eligible for insurance. Okay, we have a few questions that come in. Okay. Um, when you, this I think goes back to Neil, but when you say engineer, do you mean licensed home inspector or is engineer different? Um, well, licensed home inspector is gonna be the one doing the home. In some cases they are engineers. So um, on it depends on the company. It depends on what needs to be looked at. Um, when it comes to roofs, they usually want a licensed um, and insured roofer to take a look at them. Um, when it comes to other things, uh, you might need an engineer or you might need just a plumber to come in and do it. So it's all, that's why we're here. So that depending upon what needs to be looked at and what needs to be verified, um, you know, we can help guide you. But on, on an initial purchase where you're having a home looked at, a licensed home inspector is a good start. And as mentioned, some of them are engineers and those are the ones that can really get into the nitty gritty of the house for you. Okay. Um, does the insurance company check the home every year? Uh, no. No. <laughs> no. Thank God. Thank God they don't. <laughs> um, they usually check the home when you first buy it and they they have to do that within 60 days. And then um, after that, every three years, every five years, um, and then it depends on the size of the home, the age of the home. And if you have a claim that might prompt them to go out there and, um, and do an inspection if it's been a while. But I, I would say we see it maybe every five years and mostly on larger homes or older homes. How far back does an insurance company go for claims and are clue reports available to the public? They go back five years now. It used to be three, but now it's five. It's even five for auto insurance claims. Um, and clue rep reports are not available to the public. Um, they're only available if you're applying for insurance. Um, and as Neil said, we need the name of the the person buying the home and they, they don't have to have committed to the home. They can be calling for a quote and say, you know, I want an idea for my budget, whether I'm going to buy this home or not. And when we put their name, their current address in and their date of birth, that will um, allow us to access a clue report for the house that they're thinking of buying. Okay. And then some pump electrical backup with a question mark. So maybe just some explanation of what that means. Um, you say it has to be well, backup okay. to a generator or a backup battery, you said? Um, some pump has to be hooked up to a battery so that it will work when the electricity goes out. Um, and you can also hook it up to a generator. So it has to be, it can't, you, you can put some pumps in and if you, and they'll, you know, they'll run on their own, but if, if the electricity goes out, then it's of no value. So it has to be, you know, backed up with a battery or a generator. Okay, that's it for now. All right, so let's talk about 
renovations. As we all know, the um, inventory of homes is a, is a lot smaller than it used to be. And there are a lot of homes that are that need work when people buy them mm -hmm. and um, and sellers reluctant to do anything because they know people want homes. So they're saying, hey, somebody wants a new kitchen, let them put the new kitchen in. I'm not going to do it. So a lot of people are considering doing renovations. It would be wise to at least alert people if they're going to do renovations that if they're small renovations, try to set it up before they move, before they close so that they have their, their um, architect lined up, they have their contractor lined up so that they can move fast on it. Because as I said before, the companies have 60 days to do their inspection and they're going to be there right away. If the house is vacant or unoccupied, they're going to get off of the risk. If they're going to do major renovations, they're going to get off the risk. So we're we're advising people, please move in, move in, and then consider your renovations after that 60 days is up. Once the 60 days is up, the insurance company is on that risk for three years. So you know, get through that 60 day period where the insurance company can say, we don't want you. If you're doing renovations, um, you still may need to, to add a, um, you know, course of construction endorsement to the policy. Mm -hmm. And if they're major renovations, then the insurance company is going to push you to go for a builder's risk policy. So those are all conversations we can have with the, with the buyer and, and discuss with them. And, and give them their options. And, um, you know, we do have access to builder's risk and some of our companies even, um, you know, will stay on the risk and, and add an endorsement to the policy. So it all depends on what you're doing. Um, make sure that, you know, you have a general contractor doing the work. Um, it's really best that you're not doing it yourself, that you get a, a general contractor to do it. Get a certificate of insurance from the contractor that names you as an additional insured. And, um, you know, again, try to contact the contractors um, prior to closing so that you're ready to go. Um, and please move in because that's just a difficult one if you don't. All right, let's see. Fun. Flood insurance. Okay, let's talk a little bit about flood insurance. Um, as we all know, we've had historical uh, rainfall. If you remember July of 2023, Highland Falls was devastated with, with just rain that just did not stop. And most of those people, they, they were not in flood zones. And an X zone is, is, doesn't require you to have flood insurance. The, the banks don't require it. And now all of a sudden you've got flood damage. Your homeowner policy says, mm -mm, flood is, floods excluded. We're not covering it. And you know, you have no, no, no recourse except to go to FEMA and get some loans to try to repair the damage. Um, you know, climate change is is affecting everything. And um I, I try to encourage people to buy flood insurance at least for the first year or so so that they know um, the, how the water flows around them when, when we get rain. Um, you know, there are situations when um, people do, repair, do building around you. So let's say you have a neighbor, they put in a new driveway with curbs. Those curbs weren't there before. Now when it rains, the water's going in a different direction. They, um, decide to put a French drain around their home and that water is being moved in a different direction. And now when it rains, the water is coming into your yard. So we have one area um, here in Tarrytown where they put in a whole new development and now people that are below this development when it rains hard are all getting water in their basements. So things like that can affect you. And if you have flood insurance, at least you'll have some recourse um, for doing the repairs and then figuring out what you can do to avoid this happening again in the future. Things that affect the, the flood insurance rates are occupancy. 
if it's a primary residence, you're going to get your best rate. The secondaries and rentals get surcharged. Um, a walkout basement versus below ground, the walkout basement usually gets a, a better rate. Um, and being built pre firm, there was, you know, when flood insurance went into effect, um, the policies that were built before that, um, they're kind of grandfathered because they didn't know building above base flood elevation. They didn't have access to that. So they're they're kind of grandfathered. But if you build after that, then the, then FEMA has rules and regulations you have to follow in, in how you build. Um, private flood insurance is available now. It, it is expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt about it. But you, you get a much better policy for your money. So if you think that you have um, exposure to flooding, I would encourage a, a private flood policy. You're going to have coverage for a finished basement. You're going to have coverage for loss of use. Um, under the FEMA policies, if you're flooded and you have to go stay in a hotel or, or rent a home while they're fixing the damage, there is no, there is no coverage for that under the FEMA policy. So um, the private policies, as I said, are, are a lot better. Topography changes, we talked about, you know, um, watch what's going on with your neighbors and, and what they're doing because that's gonna push water in other directions and that's um, maybe a concern. And, um, you know, we're here to answer your questions about flood insurance, please don't hesitate to call us. We're happy to run flood zones. Um, the, the certificates that we get for the flood zones will tell you how far you are from a flood zone, if you're not in one, what your exposure is, how much damage has been in your area over um, the last decade. Um, those are all things that um, are helpful in making a decision on, on buying a home. So please don't hesitate with that. All right, water backup coverage. Um, water backup coverage you know, we we use that a lot when water gets into a basement. Um, I don't write a homeowner policy without it. And, you know, we just feel that it's really important coverage. Um, and um, this this will cover if the sump pump fails this and, and the water gets in. You know, if, if a lot of water comes in and some pumps underwater, um, you know, guess what? It's you're going to have a lot of damage from that. Um, it covers the damage that it does to um, to the to your property, to your contents, to you know. There, there's the exclusions under a flood policy are a lot greater than under the water backup. So when we can, we try to get any claims covered under water backup. Um, you know, I talked about the sump pump failing that can cause the water to back up if the if the sump pump is underwater, you know, if you've got four feet of water in your basement, the chances are this isn't going to cover it. The company's going to say, no, that's flood, and you're going to have needed a flood policy. But generally speaking, for the six inches a foot of water where the sump pump just can't keep up with it, this is this is a great coverage to have. Um, it'll cover the cleanup after the water loss and cover the damages. Um, Talking about cleanup after a water loss, I can't stress enough how important it is to bring in a professional. Please don't try to do it yourself. It is so difficult to clean water. It it just it gets absorbed <clears throat> into your your sheetrock. It's behind the walls. It's it's underneath places that you're not even thinking of. And you think you cleaned it up by taking that wet vac, and then months later. Um, you've got mold climbing up through the wall and you've got a really big problem. So, you know, use a professional to clean up that water. They come in, they have a water meter. They put that water meter on the wall and they'll, they'll tell you, hey, there's water behind this sheetrock. We've got to take this sheetrock down, things that you can't see. So again, please make sure if you have a water loss um, that you um, get a professional to clean it up. Uh, we have a question. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned when builders change topography that causes flooding, who's responsible? <laughs> yeah. I guess that's between you and your neighbor. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's 
I'm going to use Laura as an example because, you know, she had some drainage put in her backyard and it pushed it over into her neighbor's yard. And the neighbor came knocking at the door saying, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing here? Um, so she had to call the, the contractor back to come in and redo it. Um, so, yeah, I guess, you know, you're responsible because you're the one that that, you know, authorized the contractor to do the work. Okay. Okay. All right. We are going to move on to um, some commercial insurance and um, the, um, some of the topics that Laura is going to talk about um, will actually, you know, the leases and cyber and some of these things will impact you on residential as well. And even personally give you some ideas. So um I'm going to turn it over to Laura and um, she will. Yeah, feel free to interject whenever you, you know, something overlaps. Hi, I'm Laura Murray. I'm in charge of the commercial lines department here. And I just wanted to touch on some things that I felt you might come across that would help your um, clients, either as a landlord or a tenant. Um, the things that we see in the commercial lines that are prevalent. Um, when it comes to landlord tenant leases, um, something that is newly required, insurance companies are not writing or most are not writing coverage if you don't require your tenants to carry general liability of 100,000, which is the minimum countrywide. So in this area, we see it higher, but it's very important that as a landlord, you require this of your tenant because you can't just assume that they're going to be, you know, uh, know to get it or go get it. A lot of insurance is triggered by requirements, right? Banks require it, contracts, leases. So as a landlord, it's very important to just put it in there so the tenant's like, oh, okay, I need to get this. Let me make sure I have the coverage. And it's a way to protect you. You know, as a landlord owning a property, you're bringing in maybe multiple tenants. Um, the You need to risk transfer. The responsibility should be on tenants when it is their responsibility and the insurance policy is a way to help have something there to respond. Also, as a landlord, you want to make sure that you're listed as an additional insured. You've heard this term um, multiple times. It, it's a very specific wording. This is landlord is included as additional insured. If your landlord term is more in depth, you, you, know, you put all of that in, into the lease so that when for coverage to be triggered in commercial lines, if it's in the lease, it's automatically triggered. You're not spending time making sure you're getting an endorsement and that you're named on it improperly. And as long as all the wording is in your lease, it'll be triggered by the policy that the tenant to carry. Um, we Mark, really encourage you. Well, can I interject for just yes. a minute? Um, I just want to say on, on residential that um, that additional insured endorsement, if you if you see it on um for the the um oh, I'm not going to say buyer but the person who wants to rent an apartment or a home um in mm -hmm. personal insurance you cannot get an additional insured endorsement you can get an additional interest endorsement which is very different so um if you're if they're making up a lease for your um, the person that you're representing that wants to rent a home or an apartment, um, if that additional insured is in there, um, please educate them that you can't, they cannot get that as an individual. That's only for commercial, um, entities. Correct. Um, as landlords, I, I encourage you to collect the certificates annually, um, you know, don't assume that it renewed with you listed as additional insured. Don't assume that the coverage renewed. And this is no fault to tenants at this stage because it's getting harder and harder to have coverage renewed as is between pricing, keeping up with inflation, companies exiting the markets, and they're informing tenants later and later. And so their clients are facing a lapse in coverage. And you're not going to know this unless you say to your your tenant, hey, where's that certificate of insurance? Your policy comes up on this date. Do you have coverage? So annually, please ask for a certificate from your tenant. Um, if when you have tenants, 
if they are doing any type of renovation or just a fix. Please have them secure certificates from the contractors. Please have those con those certificates named the landlord and the tenant as additional insured and have them provide them to you before they start the work. Because if and you want to you want all contractors to be licensed and insured. Now, if they're licensed in, in Westchester County, they're insured because Westchester County does not allow contractors to not be insured. But you want proof of this because there are plenty of contractors out there who are not licensed and not insured. And if they do work and cause damage to your building, there's no recourse. You have no insurance policy to go after for the work that they've done or the damage they've caused to you, your tenants. So before a tenant starts any kind of work or repair, make sure they're securing certificates and showing you proof of them. You know, and if you ever have a question about the certificate, the company is reputable, whatever, you know, feel feel free to reach out to me. You know, we can review it. Um, and then something that people don't think about a lot as a landlord is please require your tenants to carry what's called business personal property. So their property that they own in their location, because if that gets damaged and they can't continue to work, they're a coffee shop or retail store or something, and they don't have the insurance policy to make themselves whole, they're not going to be able to bring an income. Then they're going to go, you know, obviously not be able to pay rent or be able to keep up with the property. You don't have to put a limit on them. You don't have to say how much, but it's just, again, a nice reminder in your lease because you're thinking for your tenant who might not know to think of these things to insure. Um. And then my next slide is what insurance companies require. It's a little bit of overlap, but these are the things that they're requiring now in order to be eligible for insurance. So like I said, leases with all tenants, it seems common sense, but there are people out there who might not. And where you see this, this gap a lot is if you own the building in one entity and then say you are the tenant as well, um, you need a, a lease with yourself. Entities are separate. You know, it's you're not the one in the same. So if I buy a building under Laura Inc. and then I open a bakery, that bakery and that Laura Inc. need to have a lease with each other, transferring the risk. Um, again, they say a hundred thousand minimum. We don't write any kind of business insurance liability under a million dollars. It's you know we're in the metro tri-state area. That can go very quickly. Um, landlord as additional insured. Now, if you're if you're working with cooking exposures, restaurants, um, bakeries that cook in house, coffee shops that cook, you you need to be sprinklered. Our local municipality here in Tarrytown, if you put in a cooking exposure, they have to put a sprinkler system in. Now, I know it's an expense. Um, it's usually an expense of the tenant, not the landlord, but it companies honestly will not write a cooking exposure risk without sprinkler. Sprinklers give you up to 15% credit on the insurance. So it does, there is a little bit of offset to the cost. Um, but if you, and if you have residential above the cooking exposure in your building without a sprinkler system, they're never going to write the insurance. It's too much of a risk. A fire comes on, those people upstairs, are, you know, there's a chance of them surviving is slim and the companies just won't take that on. Um, buildings over two stories need two means of egress, two ways to get out. And while this is important on older structures when they might've been grandfathered in and didn't have to have this, if you go to write the policy today, the insurance company is gonna come out and inspect and there's not another way out with three stories and above. If they aren't have another way to get out, fire escape something, they're not gonna write it. Uh, the theory is you can jump out of two stories and still survive. I, I guess from three stories, they decided that's where you need another way besides jumping out of the window. <laughs> um, roofs, just like they said in personal lines, people need to keep up their properties. A 20 year old roof, it, it, while it might not have damage, while it might be great, it's on the end of its life. So for an insurance company to come in and say, I'm going to insure a building where the roof is already 20 years old, you know, it's a risk that not, they don't want to take. Um, you know, it can, it can be expected by a roofer and they can say it's fine, but companies are, you know, they're private companies. They're allowed to have their own rules and 20 years or older, they're really staying away from. And a lot of that also echoes back onto electrical, plumbing, HVAC. Like we said, they just want you to maintain your properties because that helps alleviate 
claims coming up that can be controlled by yearly maintenance. Um, and then my last slide. I'm not paying attention here. Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> cyber. Now, this says cyber exposure for landlords, but cyber affects everyone. Personal, commercial, tenant, landlord, everyone that does business is affected by cyber. You have an email, you, you do banking. All of this is an exposure to what are called hackers who sit around all day long, wait for you to be vulnerable and take your money. Um, check washing is a huge thing we see still today. People really think that it doesn't happen because everything's online, but if someone takes the check out of the mail, erases who it was made to and redoes it to themselves and takes out hundreds of thousands of dollars because there's no limit to that number. They're making it up. You know, how are you, how are you going to recover from this? As landlords, you know, you accept checks now, especially with management companies, you expect uh, online. Um, a lot of people use like email links. And what they do is they spoof your email, send an email to your tenant, to your vendor, whoever, say, oh, you need to make this payment. And you said, oh, let me just use this link. No big deal. And when you pay through that link, it goes to the hacker. And the, to get that back, that's what a cyber liability policy is there for. It responds to the situation that happened. It finds out how it happened. It shuts it down. And it helps you with the cost associated that come from a cyber attack. So no one is exempt from a cyber exposure, but there's different types. And even in personal lines now, there are policies available mm -hmm. to insureds to protect, you know, and it's to work with your banks. You know, these we're not working against or separate. Banks provide plenty of products for fraud that help you. And those are great products. But on top of that, if you have a cyber attack, to respond to the, especially for a business, there's laws you have to respond to. You don't know that. And that's what a policy does. It comes in, it helps you, it informs you. It's just like responding to a summons. You don't know how to do that. You bring in a lawyer. Well, an insurance policy is there for that as well. So remember, everything is personal information. Your name, your address, your phone number, your email, all of that is personal. If you get attacked and that information is leaked of others, of your clients, of your tenants, you have a responsibility to respond to that. And that's where a cyber policy will help you along the way in all that. Um, that's a brief overview, obviously. Any questions at any point, always feel free to reach out to us and I can answer anything else. All right. I think that pretty much wraps it up. Okay, let's see. Neil? Hey, um, so just... Wrapping things up, um, now more than ever, your clients need an insurance agent. As you could see, there's a lot of obstacles that can get in the way. Uh, there's a lot of information out there that needs to be gone over, and, and we can help answer any questions they have. Because working with an agent means they'll have someone on their side to help them make sense of their options and getting the right coverage for their individual needs. We're an independent agency, so we represent about a dozen insurance carriers. So it allows us to find the best coverage for them and try to work within their budget at the same time, but also advocate for things or correct information that may be not, not correct and have a, somebody to go to the company on their behalf. Okay, we have two more uh, statement and a question. Um, and I agree. It seems like insurance companies have a plethora of requirements, criteria, eligibility, and no wonder homeowners can't afford policies, especially with these current economic times. And we we understand that. <laughs> we agree that the more eligibility and the way the insurance companies change, it gets harder and harder. But that's the importance of an independent agent as ourselves. We're here to help you and walk you through those steps. Um, and then... We never answered the question about sewer and water coverage. Um, I know we touched on it, so if you, I'm not sure specifically what the um, else you had on it, if you want to reach out to us individually, give us a call about it or write more into the chat so that we can answer it. 
Um, I guess we can, I could say, you know, you're asking, is there insurance on sewer and water coverage? So if you're asking if there's coverage for the pipes that go from the house to the road, yes, um, some companies sell it, um, not all. So you'd have to check with your company. Um, if you're asking about the water backup, again, you have to specifically buy that coverage that doesn't come with every policy. Um, if if you have other questions about it, I'm we're more than happy to answer it. All right. Yes. All right. Any other questions? Oh, they're have... going to reach out to us. Well, that's so. good. Okay. Yeah, I'll be glad to to have a conversation. All right. All right. Wait. Um, um, just one more. Okay. Okay. Did you cover slate roofs? There was a discussion of asphalt roofing. Um, we briefly touched upon it. Slate roofs are completely different and not subject to the same age restrictions. What companies look at with the slate roof, because a slate roof doesn't get replaced every every 20 years or so, it they want to make sure that the slate roof is maintained. They want to make sure the shingles are in good order, that they're not full of moss and growth, discoloration, and they want to make sure any of the loose or cracked ones are replaced. Slate roofs get serviced and there should be some type of maintenance done on a regular basis. And that's what they would ask about. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, are there some more messages in there, Laura? Nope, that's the last one. All right. Oh, wait. Hey, wait. Thank you, everyone. That was really an informative presentation. And like I said, we'll be um, sending the recording out either later today or tomorrow for everyone. So um, thank you, Joanne, Neil, okay. and Laura. Yeah. And thank you all for joining us. And um, we will see you the next, I think we have a, I um, believe it's next Tuesday. There is another uh, Breakfast with Benefits. This is one is with Citibank and talking about what's ahead for the 2024 economy. So that should be very interesting as well. Good so, one. Thank you all again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Right. Have a good day. Bye-bye.